we are doing our first ever simulcast on Astronomical Society. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. That's our home group. I can see the auditorium has been refurbished for the six months since we last opened the doors here. I um, want to give a big shout out for Don, Nick, and several staff who are uh, assisting us tonight, and also for our conference spot. Really making it possible for our current to return. I'd like to thank y'all for. Uh, you know, space now. Um, looks like we've got a pretty good crowd tonight. A lot of people who are not here to come to our online meetings. So good to see y'all again. And uh, it's going to be a little bit different for the time being. As you can see, there is no staff table, but we're going to give this a whirl and see where we go from here. All right. For those of y'all who don't know, in case we have any new people, any new people? Welcome, we have to find out about us. Cool. Yes, speaker, right? Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm President Diane Hall in my third term. So this is the third real meeting that I've been able to lead in three years of being president. Um, so we kick things off with the uh, officer reports, followed by the separate reports, observing reports. Uh, other critical pieces of news, and then tonight we're going to have a short talk and a long talk. So, and um, a very brief break uh, or whatever y'all need in between. So, thank you again. Um, as the president, biggest news of the night is, of course, we are here, we are back, we are seeing one another. Um, the board has decided to not convene at Macomb, which is a Thursday, third Thursday meeting yet. Part of it is because the room there is much smaller and we frequently had standing room only anyway. Part of it is because Macomb has to transfer us around the building during the summer months. So rather than try to meet in the library, then try to work things out in a different room, then potentially try to work things out in a different room over the course of the summer. We're going to wait to see where things are at in September when we should be able to, you know, use the library room like we used to. We should at least be able to stay in it for another nine months. So, third theory of state meetings will continue to be virtual for the time being. And other news. Um, we don't have the subject happening here tonight, but as I mentioned, Tom, formerly of the Mount Pulpit Club, is our new radio subgroup captain. If you're interested in radio astronomy, uh, we would like to get that up and running again at Stargate. So uh, we have the radio group going for quite some time, and it's very exciting to be able to get it back. We have received some donations. Um, a very interesting donation that Jonathan, my partner who retrieved it for one of his books, is actually a splendid pair of bookends celebrating Galileo's starry messenger, his uh, critical work explaining that you know, there's news around Jupiter and such. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. I'm going to go to Stargate for the time being, but uh, um, frankly, I'm jealous and would love to keep it. So that, that donation is going to be reported starting as soon as we can. Um, we also have pending a donation of a antique star atlas, which we are going to be very excited to see which star atlas this might be. No, it's not going to be very good for you. But, um, you know, star atlases uh, don't come across the donation list every day. So. Going to be quite exciting to see what that's going to be. Finally, as you know from reading the laws, uh, long term member John Root uh, passed away back on the 3rd of this January. John left us an extremely generous bequest that apparently has no strings attached other than. Um, a ceremonial meeting of a star that we were going to do it in his honor. We are contemplating using it to finally get the third building started 
that would be the World Offered Observatory slash one in the up and running. So Rio is going to reopen negotiations with the Wolcott Mill people to see if we can make this a reality in his honor. So that is big, big news. And um, frankly, we are all the borders of London floored by the scope of gentleman's generosity. That concludes the presidential report. Ah, first vice president. Welcome back. For uh, June, I have got uh, some interesting news. I've got uh, really with some of the uh, that's the American Astronomical Society. I'm going to be talking about the Worldwide Telescope. Like that call the play with that. It's really cool. They'll show you some of the stuff they've added on to it. Bob Bird will also be speaking, and I also have Deirdre Kelligan. She is an anatomical artist that uh, Brother Guy had me create a blog um, uh, ID for on uh, that conservatory. And showing some, and some of her stuff is posted at that. But that was, yeah. well, she'll be giving a presentation about astronomical art. She does a lot of sketching and stuff, and a lot of outreach with kids, so that ought to be pretty cool. Um, I have slots open from July on next year. I have a few open. Great. Um, I'm going to be doing some research on uh, the Hales field survey um, because urine is pro, yay. And uh, but I don't know. <laughs> brother guy asked me to do a post about it, so I'm. So, um, it, but again, there's a lot of new missions out there. If anybody is very one. I'd, I'd love to see you do a presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Baba. And uh, second Vice President Ria Bani, who is the chairman of Stargate, who now joins us tonight on his work schedule, so I'll be reading his report on his behalf. I was going to try and put that up there, but I don't know if it'll work. It will. So, uh, starting an open house for April, the observatory opened at 639. The sky was mostly cloudy and hazy, but a few weather double stars were observed. We had Mark Kinsier, our secretary, and former President Jeff McLeod out there using an eight inch uh, USB. Steve Stewart was out there with an eight inch celestron. Portable radio telescope detected the Milky Way. Marty Coons was working on mounting H Alpha telescope to the Kalinowski Kula refractor. So, the usual game is up to the moon and thing. Roughly 35 people attended. That's our best attendance in Queens since the pandemic. And boy, the observatory did not close up until 1102. Sounds like a really fun night. Thank you all who showed up. We hope to have many more fun nights like that starting this year. The next open house is going to be Saturday, May 28th. Starting kind of the sun, an hour later, 7.30 p.m. And with that, Secretary of War, Mark Kenzie. Welcome, nice seeing everybody again. Back to the land of the living. Uh, since our, as you know, that many of these have been paid with the same certificates and everything. We had a lady providing the what that came in from American Astronomical Society, and what a better way to present it when we're back here in person. So I had our gentleman up at the desk. I said, pick a number from so-and-so to so-and-so. He gave me a number. So Robert Rooney, you here? You're Robert Rooney? Oh. I'll get another thing. He, he signed in. So. All right, we'll, we'll do it. Yeah, this is Robert Rooney. Oh, that's, that's you. Thank you. Thank you. I get a uh, background music. All right. I feel like I should be doing something a lot more epic than uh, with all that music going on. But uh, so those of you on the WebEx can now see me. And those of you out there, hopefully you can see me in this little light. Um, first time addressing you all as treasurer in a live meeting. 
So I will try and keep my report brief. Um, we have the WASP has my uh, report in it. Uh, we generally give out numbers um, prior to tonight. We were sitting at around 23,000 in our treasury, um, a little over 1,500 on our PayPal site, which we use to accept membership, make payments. Um, since we were live, I actually brought a uh, PayPal credit card reader. Uh, one thing that we're able to do when we're live is take membership renewals if you'd like to renew your membership or if you're here visiting and you would like to become a member, we can take membership payments um, live. So something to think about as we go forward. We have one new member, um, Susie Devers, if you're if you watch this presentation and if I have this up so that you can see me because we are being still recorded. Um, we have a new member, Susie Devers, and one other new renewal. Um, on the donation from John Root, do you want me to go ahead and share the number? Um, we received $9,000 in donation from John Root to use for astronomy purposes. And in addition, like Diane said, he had to request a star to be uh, picked in his name. So we are going to pick a rising star on the day of his death, 1-3-2022. Bob and I are going to look at Stellarium, look at some candidates that rise on that date, and we're going to pick one. So, um, and my mm -hmm. good friend, David, I see you online. Hi, David. Well so with that, Ooh. that is the end of my report. If there are any questions, come on and see me after either an intermission or after the meeting and um, let me know. So with that, I'm turning it back over to Madame or Madam President. Remember that I'm going to put this up here. Works. Hello. Now um, we have, of course, our outreach chair, Kevin, with his first address to our audience. So, Kevin, take it away. Stargate, but with Riyadh. Yeah. Riyadh and Steve Stewart. And then uh, we, the club is supporting the eclipse, the lunar eclipse that's on May 5th. It begins at um, nine, about a little after nine o'clock, and um, it's it's full, it's maximum around midnight, but I think it, it becomes more before that. So that is going to be here. That's here. That is right here at Cranbrook. That's here. So we're looking for uh, anybody. Show of hands. Anybody. Um, who hasn't told me he's willing to support it and bring a telescope? So okay. That includes you all on the call if you're interested in coming. Yeah, is anybody here? I'll just get your name and then we'll go. Okay. If anybody else, um, we could really use telescopes for this month. This is the kind of event the public loves. We have had hundreds of people out of zero. It's not going to have hundreds of people looking at it. We just have a glimpse to one of our telescopes. So if you are available, I strongly urge you to bring whatever you've got. It doesn't have to be a fancy scope. It can be binoculars on a map. Um, this will make people very, very happy. Just for you. Yeah, we'll we'll tell the moon to go behind the shadow on Saturday. That'd help me too, because then I don't have to. Yeah, he's not a self. Full disclosure, and then we can move on to the next item of business. I agree to be in Vegas doing something other. Than so all of you out there, please get your pictures. You know, I usually take photos. Please take one for me. The Milky Way will be rising. The galactic core will be rising under this lunar eclipse and should be visible. So this is an awesome opportunity to get somewhere. You'll be here if you come here to celebrate with us. There should be some awesome images out there. And you may be able to look for part of the Milky Way here. Um, 
um, here at Cranbrook. So. so we'll send out another request as a reminder later, uh, you know, a few days before. If anybody, again, if anybody's available for with a telescope, it'd be great. Or just to come out and support. All right. That's the, the report. Thank you, Kevin. Good to be having Redo live out from Michigan, especially here for Okay. Um, Dale Teamy is joining virtually. Dale Teamy is our editor from Florida. We don't be able to hear you if you give a So I'll just stand to the half. The walk is out on the first of the month. They were the tight ship. And uh, of course, anybody who wants their art, pictures, stories, articles, reviews, or whatever included in the WASP, send it to Dale or classified ads. We don't charge. With that, um, it is time for the SEP group report. So, Solar Marty, friends, what's going on in the sun, Captain? I can come to you. So the sun has been pretty active the past uh, two years. Well, actually, last month. Lots of flares, uh, lots of sunspots. Only two sunspots right now, like that photograph. So not real impressive right now. But uh, last week we had a group of four large sunspots. There's been lots of flares, higher class flares, lower class flares. So the sun is very, very active. Um, I'm working with Riyadh, the observatory chairman, to mount our hydrogen alpha telescope out at Stargate. I have to get an adapter plate. So I'm trying to find an adapter plate that will match our telescope and will uh, adapt. If not, we'll just try to make one somehow. So we will be doing some uh, solar solar viewing out at Stargate during the uh, open houses. And I've been watching the sunspots with my solar binoculars too. Thank you, Captain Marty. Good to have you back. Marty was one of those who could not join us virtually during the last two years. Okay, uh, Double Star Sub Group, led by Riyadh, will meet at Stargate at the next open house. Again, that's the fourth Saturday of the month. Uh, Radio Sub Group, uh, hopefully, will be operating a similar schedule. Um, history Sub Groups, exploits as ever, can be read in the WASP. Check out our archive. They all have been scanning um, things for the Detroit Astronomical Society, so those were our, our most recent ones. And uh, urban astronomy, which has been another Jordan subgroup, may be getting a resurrection. Bob Tremblay and I, as officers of y'all, have been invited to participate in a multi group, multi club, multi institutional effort to make Belle Isle the first urban dark sky site in Michigan. Of course, Michigan already has two internationally recognized dark sky preserves and six state preserves at state parks and recreational areas. Belle Isle would be the um, easily the most accessible to the largest number of people. And it's in the river by Lake St. Clair. The skies are quite good. So we're going to see if this can be accomplished. Um, it's spearheaded by fabulous people like Sally Uwe, who uh, got the lighting restrictions passed <clears throat> in Ann Arbor. And um, yeah, we are excited and hopefully we can make the long held dream of several boards in a row of doing Belle Isle Dark Sky events. Um, we can make that a reality. So that would be amazing. Uh, with that good news, I think we have Alcor. That's Adrian. Yep, I will come back up or let's see. Okay, so in the last, you'll see a flyer for Alcor, and on the screen, for those of you here, you'll see a flyer for Alcor. Um, some important notes are that. Um, Registration is fast approaching. Last day of normal registration for our board is um, May 25th. I'm actually seeking out the email to share with you, but um, it's May 25th. Registration prices will rise up. 
and it's in Albuquerque this year. It's going to be an in-person event. Um, I will be sending email to find out how much of it will be online. I do actually believe it's a hybrid, but there will be in-person things. And I think for you probably uh, to be more than the rest of us, uh, something to attend um, online. Um, David, are you going to be at that event, the uh, Alcor event? Uh, you're muted, so I can't hear you here. There you go. Now I need it again. Yeah, let's. Uh... Yeah, we won't. Yeah, so, and I know there's another star party that will be at later in the summer. So, so if you are interested in attending the um, Astronomical League in person event, just let me know and I can send in your membership. If you have questions about it, let me know as well. And I will send in, um, if, it, if I don't know the answers, I'll send them in to the Astronomical League membership that I know of. Um, Terry Mann and Chuck Allen and a few of them I've met through the, uh, the Explore Scientific Global Star Party, which is in part um, sponsored and attended by the Astronomical League. Every Tuesday night, they do a live stream on Explore Scientific's website. ExploreScienceCity.com slash live, or you can find it on Facebook. Um, David Levy is a frequent guest. I'm usually there later in the evenings, um, showing casing some imaging that I've done. And there's other there's other guests, some that are also from Michigan. Some, uh, really good astrophotographers share their work, as well as uh, David Eicher, the uh, Editor, editor in chief of Astronomy Magazine often shows up. So you never know who will be there, and more and more people have been joining in. It's uh, still an online global star party, um, free to attend. Just um, jump in, and um, you can watch every Tuesday night unless otherwise announced. So, so that's my announcement for Astronomical League. Do you have GLAC for us, Adrian? Um, GLAC. Let's see, we we still have to transfer some funds to the GLAC account. Other than that, we are full steam ahead on an in-person GLAC event this year. Um, we've begun um, discussing at the board meetings, which all of you are invited to come in and listen to. The um, GLAC board meetings, we're discussing how we're going to do after a two-year hiatus, how we're going to... Uh, take the steps to do the uh, in-person event and what we're going to need. And it'll be at Island Lake, right? It'll be at Island Lake. Working. Yep, we're working with the DNR at Island Lake to uh, for um, logistics. Yep, you have a question. Island Lake, which is across from Kensington Metro Park, so it's Island Lake State Park. State Rec area. Yeah, right. state. Yep, directly across 96 from Kensington Metro Park, where it was when I first joined an astronomy club. So, um, yep, so it'll be in person. Um, usually around, it's around this time or next month, the planning begins in earnest and the monies begin getting spent for tents. And we are discussing whether or not we want to make that a hybrid event only to bring in remote speakers, or if we just want to do a full in-person event. Um, last year, we were talking about making it just about the telescopes, so there's a good chance that this year that might be what we end up doing, is just making it about observing the sky. And one more thing before I give up the microphone is, during the uh, astronomy, during astronomy at the beach, that planetary lineup that we've got this summer will be on display. There will be some five or six planets, plus the moon will be a part of that line. It'll be, uh, I believe it will be waning. It'll be a waning gibbous at the time. What are the dates, Adrian? Dates are September. It's the weekend before the dark of the moon. Okay. And that'll be real quick. Third quarter? Third quarter, September 16th and 17th. Nice. So, 
that will be happening a week before some of the larger star parties, such as Oki Techs, which I will be attending again. So look out for some more images from that. So that is all I have. Unless you have anything else for me to announce, I will clear the stage and our president is returning. All right, y'all. So um, for observing reports, I'm afraid that if you have a virtual observing report, we're not going to be able to hear you here in the Tampa Auditorium. Please hold on to all of you joining us virtually. Please hold on to those until our next meeting on Thursdays, because that will be all virtual. Everybody will be on the same page. In the meantime, do we have any in-person observing reports from those of y'all here at Cranbrook. I know we have a lot of people up at one of the star parties in Cadillac West, including our internal managers, Ben Bach and Bill Beers, which is why the NASA has photography to give their report. Any observing reports, I know the weather's been pretty lousy. No observing reports, okay. Anything else for the good of the club from y'all at Cranbrook? Question for my dad, and it's a wonderful question. Yes, right now is hosting a limited exhibition on space. It is for all ages. There is something for uh, Apollo era enthusiasts like me. There is something for ISS enthusiasts. And there's a lot for little kids to fire the imagination and get them interested in going to Mars and elsewhere. So we highly recommend the uh, space exhibit that's here on the ground floor at Cranbrook right now. Great question, Lee. Question, Diane. When does it yes, Jim. Uh, how many people are how many people are live there at Cranbrook? Twenty-six. Twenty-six, is that what I heard? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. All right, we can hear y'all. How about some observing reports from those of you on the Actually, can you all the way to the back row? David. Got a report that the audio is a little choppy. Okay. Um, let's. Uh, any other questions? Because that was a good one. I don't know when it's open. Actually, my guys here at the museum up in the lobby. So check, check the sign in before you leave. Um, okay, cool. Um, it is now eight o'clock. I believe that means it's time for our short presentation. And our short presentation tonight is done by somebody who is quite familiar to all of you. He uh, has an extensive experience with the sky from virtual telescopes to the Keweenaw Peninsula, having attended TAC up there. He's got deep passion for education. He's an aficionado of birds. And he works in one of the coolest jobs in astronomy for the Vatican Observatory. Of course, that can only be one gentleman. That is our first vice president program chair, Bob Tremley. And he's going to be giving you one of his classics tonight. Take it away, Bob. All right. Thank you, Diane. Go both you and so I am going to be demonstrating a package tonight, an application called Universe Sandbox. It pretty much lets you play God. You can uh, create a solar system. You can uh, do just a whole bunch of stuff. So what I've got here, uh, I, this is the first time I've run this version on uh, this laptop. And when they come out with a new update, they do this thing. And this update includes Cooler explosions, and explosions are a big deal with this application. Yeah, we'll get you going. So when you, when you fire up the application, it, it starts off at, at the solar system here, 
And uh, like most game engines, you can rotate, zoom, and stuff like that. Um, you can pause time on this. You can accelerate time. Let's go to the Earth here, if I can find the Earth. There we go. So I've clicked on the Earth. Oh, there's the Earth, and it shows you night lights. Like that, and but you can click on a planet here, and it'll bring up uh, it'll bring up a list with a, a thousand different things you can do on this. And they've added some stuff in. You can you can have temperature gradients and stuff like that, but you can just do all sorts of stuff. Like well, let's just say I want to tidally lock the Earth. Glasses. Looking angry at the screen all the time. Much better, I can see now. All right, so I'll go to actions here. I think it's there. Hmm. Motion. So many different. There it is, tidally locked. Doink. So now the Earth is tidally locked with the sun. So I think you have an idea what's going to happen to the Earth. Well, let's find out what happens here, because one of the really cool things that this thing can do is model climate. So we're going to let time run here. So this part, of the, this part of the Earth is always pointing toward the sun, and this part of the Earth is always pointing away from the sun. It's not hard to see what's going on there, though. So let's change the lighting to not realistic. So we're back to the Earth freezing and eventually the, the entire thing is going to freeze up in front of the earth it's going to get very hot and the back of the earth is going to turn into an ice wall. Does that mean that freeze out? Okay, discussion But one of the things that this thing has here is if you just kind of open here, it's got a bazillion different simulations. And one of the things that everybody just loves to see is uh, collisions and stuff, and, and they excel at that. So here's the Earth and the Moon. And, oh, hold on, hold on. Oh, you cannot have no sound on here. It does have music. I'll turn the music off. But it also has collision sound. Oh, yeah. It's got Okay, let me turn it off because you won't be able to hear me. Hopefully those of you on the call can see just enough. That looks like a collision dot. So this is a slow motion uh, moon hitting the moon hitting the earth. And one of the things they added in a recent update was um thermal heating and stuff like that. So you can actually see this shockwave move around the earth and you can see it crawling up the moon there. One of the things that they are working on, if they notice the earth is nice and round, well that 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 collision the earth would be doing that. They're working on that. They're working on particle effects so that you can simulate that moon hitting the earth uh, sideways and the splat coming out. So what you're seeing here now is the earth heating up. And uh, that shockwave is moving around. Let me accelerate time a little bit here. So that shockwave is moving up. The Earth is heating up. It's turning incandescent. And stuff is just flying off of it. So that's one of the collisions. Now let's go, let's go back to uh, this is the solar system again. Here it is, the solar system. There was a presentation we had here a long time ago. And... Um, one of the questions that somebody asked is, what would happen if the sun went away? Well, click on the sun and press the delete key. All the planets continued going off straight in uh, ten tangentially to wherever they were going. And it's real unfortunate for the solar system because you can make the sun go away. Now, one of the other simulations in here, um, there it is. There is the solar system with a black hole, a one solar mass black hole. So if you replace the sun with a one solar mass black hole, absolutely nothing would happen, 
except we start getting really, really cold. Everything is still orbiting that one solar mass. So that's kind of weird. You can do all sorts of things like this too. You can, you can um, start a new empty scenario here and add, let's see, let's add the earth and plop the earth there and it's rotating. And you can add, let's say you wanna add another earth. Well, you can pick it and you can either launch it or automatically orbit, let's launch it. Launch the earth through the earth, there we go. I have no sound here. Yeah, it was a lot of floaty sounds. So it has a ton of different objects. So you can put a black hole. Let's do a that's 10 10k solar mass black hole. Okay, so there's your black hole. I zoom out far enough, can't see it because there's no accretion disk. The only way you're gonna see this is if you Rotate. Oh, where, where's my where's my black hole? Yeah. I lost my black hole. So it's just it's that's bad. Light. You can't see it, right? There it is. So you rotate around. on oh, launching thing. Still. So that's the one you can't see. It. You rotate around so the black hole weird. Let's see. Um, it's rather unspectacular. Uh, I mean, there's a simulation here of the earth and a black hole and it just goes boop gone. It doesn't like plow through the earth and the earth doesn't do the you know the Vulcan uh destroying its thing. I wish it did, but it does. So it's got, it's got a kind of vision to the moon and the moon and the moon. Yeah. But also, says that it's where it is. Um, it's got. This point, we've got a whole bunch of exoplanets laid out. This showing you the habitable zone and the frost zone. I'm Francis one that's laid out like that. So it's got all these historical ones. It's got a whole ton of different exoplanets. And again, this is this is being a this is physics simulating. So if I made that sun go away, they'd all fly out there. Also has. Yeah, so let's, let's uh, uh, accelerate that because this is going to take forever. Black holes merge. I am stressing this. I am stressing this piece to its limits. But so here you've got the galaxies merging and like the mice got stars flying out all over the place. So yeah, you see that they're running very, very, very slow, and that's kind of cool. Yep. A, a long time from now, yes. So this is simulation. What would happen if the sun blew up? Well, the sun's never gonna blow up. Well, this is what would happen if the sun blows up. You can you can do this simulation a couple times. It's got absolutely fantastic uh, um, code for generating. Each one of these supernova explosions looks different. They're, they're, they all look gorgeous. But you can you can zoom in and oh, well, Jupiter's already gone. And Saturn here is a comet. So it's got a whole bunch of, so I hadn't even seen this one. It's got just weird, weird experiments. And it's all stable. This one, what is this called? This is called Super Atomic. And what's really cool is that you can create systems and stuff like that, and you can create systems you want. 
and uh, then you can share them on Steam and download them. And people have created uh, simulations of a whole bunch of different um, spacecraft and stuff like that. I particularly like this one. That shows a supernova inside the arm of a galaxy. And that shows you, you know, the, the supernova cloud going off and then fading into the interstellar medium to become other stars. But so that, that is what happens over, over millions of, of years. This is solar system. Um, let's see, can I, one of the cool things I use in some of my uh, um, posts, when I talk about, you know, various stars, let's get stars, stars there. Let's say I want to see a comparison, comparison of Betelgeuse, wonk, and oops, the sun. And this, this is kind of funny. Where's the sun? I know the sun is there. There's the sun. Put that right there and stop it because I don't like it. So there's the sun. Compared to Betelgeuse. Yeah. And it's also got you know the simulation. You've, you've seen um, the all of the planets between um, the Earth and the Moon. There they are. Now these have uh, there's all the planets between the Earth and the Moon. Now they have. I'm not really. I don't really like the way they simulate ring systems or all part individual particles like that. And they've locked all the planets here. If I unlock the planets, they'd all suck into Jupiter. Because <laughs> that's what would happen. So they come up with updates of this frequently, and and you'll you'll see things like this that they're adding stuff in constantly. Um, back to the solar system was kind of funny. There. Let's pause it. Oh no, we want the solar system now. There it is. This is the solar system. It should be the solar system right now, live. And what I find is funny is they got the Tesla Roadster in here. <laughs> yeah, what, what would be left of it now? So there's the Tesla Roadster. I'll, I'll, I'll pass your word for the cars. It's just the generic Milky Way moving. And again, this is this is simulating a whole, whole bunch of things that I can't stop doing. It is pretty it is pretty hot. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Oh, one thing I didn't show you is for fun. They added this back in. Uh I'm so glad they did this. Is that you can launch stuff and uh, and you can add your nodes in. I, I can flood it with water and water on it with the chloroform on it. But um, where is well, there it is? Giant space laser. So that's pretty funny. In case you miss all the uh folks that are on the live stream right now. So this is the Parker Solar Probe's closest approach to the sun. Uh, they added this in a couple of years ago um, after it happened. And they do that quite frequently. Um, they did have the human mission in there as part of the Parker Solar Probe, and it wouldn't surprise me at all that the Colombo is in here in, in the near future. They're, they're adding stuff constantly. And what's interesting, Back to the main, oh, it's not here. Right here under the main menu, you're typically going to see looking to hire an astronaut. This game, it is being updated frequently. The latest update came out just a couple weeks ago. Um, I said, uh, you can put this in front of a kid who likes space and they'll play with it for hours. I know I do. And I said, it's great for uh, creating images 
um, for posts and stuff. I, I do that frequently too. And doing what if scenarios, you know, the, what, what if I threw the earth at, at Uranus and see what happened. Now, one of the things I'm not really sure it's going to happen. Let me add the that's the physicist here. Is is I'm not sure this is going to happen. The sun and the sun. There it is. The sun colliding with the sun. Supernova. Was that going to happen? I I am not really sure that two solar masses, I, it would be spectacular merger, but I'm not sure it would do that. That would be, a, who would I ask about that? How am I looking on time? Good, all right. So explosions. One of the things, oh, 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 I wanted to show you that. Control N. Shoot. This is showing the Roche limit. They added code in for this recently. If two bodies uh, get too close to each other, um, just pause. Okay, good. What can happen is the smaller the two bodies can start experiencing uh, gravitational shear. And start to uh, oh, let, let's create our own. Let's add Saturn in here, doink, and put a very unfortunate uh, Earth right next to it in orbit. Really close. Slow it down a bit. What's going to happen to the Earth? this close is it should start tearing itself apart. I have to get you a little closer. I think I do. Well, that's one of the cool things you can do about this is go to the edit and move it in closer. Is that gonna, is that gonna impact? I don't know, that might impact. Come on, start tearing yourself apart. Closer, all right, closer it is. It's gonna impact, you're gonna impact. Uh, that is gonna impact, there we go. Bye, boom, Earth sucked up Saturn. Earth Saturn sucked up Earth. So um, this is pretty interesting. What they've got stress tests, and I won't. I will not be doing the, the stress tests. Chaotic orbits. Um, historical fiction. This is fictional thread worlds. This is um, this is five worlds of the exactly the same mass in the same orbit that would be stable. I, I, I've never read that science fiction. They've got one in here that I'm pretty sure everybody here has heard about. This is the world of uh, um, George R. R. Martin's uh, um, Game of Thrones. This is this is uh, this is one possible explanation for what's going on. It's a planet orbiting a binary star, and the two binary stars orbiting like that is going to cause very unpredictable weather. Well, that's pretty cool. So they, they, they've got some of these built-in scenarios. They've got a scenario here. Let's see. Black hole. So yes, black hole passing through the solar system, although I don't like what they did with uh, the, the center of, uh, where, where is it? Where is the black hole? That's the solar system. I can spell. Yeah, I can't find that. 
here today's simulation that you might you might have heard about the possibility of there being a planet nine some large something or other out in the Oort cloud this is a, a simulation of what that could look like I'm, i i've heard tell that it's a primordial black hole but you know since we haven't found those yet i'm i'm going to presume judgment on that and I'm I'm a little dubious about there being a large something way out there. I, there's got to be something out there, yeah. Even seagulls, have we seen that model in other folks? Could be a beetle Solar system with beetle juice instead of the sun. Wow, very unfortunate. Everything falls into Beetlejuice. Yep. Boom, 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 boom. So much for the solar system. This one is called a planet volatile test. And what they're doing is they have a, a bright star and you put uh, something with volatiles close to it, and it'll start to evaporate and do a tail. And what they're doing here is this is just a test. They're putting a whole bunch of objects further and further away, and you can click on every one of these things and and get that chart up and see what's going on with the surface temperature and volatiles and all that stuff. So you can simulate crazy stuff with this. Again, it's not the be all and end all. It's not entirely accurate, but it's fairly accurate. And for a twenty five dollar game. Or a play uh, from a place that sells games and, and no, there is not a free child version. There used to be an educational version, uh, Universe Sandbox One. This was Universe Sandbox Two, but they recently just renamed it Universe Sandbox, and they're just pouring everything into this guy. Uh, yeah, it it it. Uh, I run this on my other PC at home. And I'm running it at 2600 uh, by like 1920. It's it's ridiculous. And they're adding, they've added in um, recently random planets. So before you could just put planets there, like like ones that are here, you know, all the you know all the ones in the solar system. Now you can just say random, 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 random until you get one you like. And and people have liked that a lot because you can create you know your own systems that way. Like I said, you can play God, create your own systems, which is kind of cool. We have this interesting here. So they've got, I said, they've got a ton of different things there. They've got stress tests with a thousand planets, which would take even my uh, my, my other PC down to its knees. Saturn with two hundred and fifty thousand ring particles. So yeah, the, um, yikes. And these these kind of things are just experiments in the system. You can you can lock things in. These are all the different types and sizes of objects and heat. Again, there's just, just a thousand different things you can do with this. Experiments. Uh, Gary Grid. Again, there's yeah, a ton of different experiments. These are some of the different objects you can create and play. So a fun toy. I, I I played this my 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 yikes! What is going on there? <laughs> the Earth is reforming and is blowing up and reforming. Wow! Yikes! I've not seen that one. I've not seen encounters. There it is. That's the one I was looking for. I was looking for a solar system again. This is a now again. I don't like the way they they've represented this, but orbits of the planets start going nuts when a one million mass black hole passes through the solar system. Everything just goes wacky. I don't know why they did the trail center like that. That's kind of crazy. But yeah, they got they got tons of simulations. Um, anybody you'd like to see anything in particular? It works to the center of 
simulate the center of our actual galaxy? Um, that would be space engine, not this guy. Um, I can just I can put a black hole there, but it, it's not going to have an accretion disk or anything like that. So yeah, it, it this and space engine are like two. They're similar but different. This allows you to create things and play with individual systems and stuff. Space engine lets you go anywhere in the universe, but yeah, it, so a little, a little different. So anyway, um, any questions? Yes. Can't do it. Not in this. No. So they're they're working on they're working on a particle system where um, and I've seen video. You you might you've seen I'm sure you've seen the video of 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 Thayak hitting the Earth and it's splatting out like that. They're working on that kind of physics. They're they're making bodies like they're fluid dynamic so that when the Earth gets hit, it's actually going to wobble and things are going to splat off and stuff like that. Maybe then, but right now, yeah, right now, control N. Let's see, is it... Well, yeah, so it's here, here. Let, let, let's put the Earth here and we'll throw the moon at it. And even if I do it fast, um, it just it just doesn't do it the way it just it it's the moon slows down. So we're gonna throw, we're gonna launch the moon at it, boom, and it just it sucks it in, and I just I just can't get it to do it. Like you said, it it, it just doesn't model that properly. Same initial conditions, chaos, yay, chaos. Yeah, Scott Hanley, um, the, the, the Kerbal Space Program guy, actually did a video about that, and he played with the same thing. We were having the same trouble you were in. You really got to tweak it properly to get exactly what you want. Scale what they want to be kind of pseudo chaotic. That feels the way, way down at the point where something that uh, uh, Okay. Any other questions? All right, again, this is the package is Universe Sandbox. It's universesandbox.com. It's available on Steam. I think it's like 25 bucks, so cheap. And thank you for thank you for coming. Wow, this is making my PC hot. Yeah. What kind of processor does that thing require? Uh it, it wants a gaming PC. It, it well, it, it does use, it's a game, essentially. It uses, uh, it wants a beefy graphics system. The beefier, the better. Gladly use as much as you'll give it. All right, y'all. Uh, time for a little 15-minute break. So we haven't got a snack, but, you know, uh, mill around. Don't breathe too close on one another. Check out the vending machines. Use the bathroom. And uh, Bob will reconvene at... 8.45 for our feature presentation. Good job. You might have to it, Adrian. Yeah. I'll just get set up now. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, 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 okay. Otherwise, it would be a waste of my time. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Thank you so much. I appreciate What's your name? What was your name? Well, what's your name? Gary. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Uh, my grandson, Christopher. Hi. How are you? Great, great. Thank you. Good. It's nice to be back and see people. Um, first time in two, two and a half years. Yeah, yeah. The first time I've been going to talk about this in two and a half years. Too, so. Nice. It's been a long time. Okay, so this will this will show you. Let's see how disconnect a bit. So uh, you need me to stand still. I guess I can, no. but you can move around. I got so so. Let's see. You got your computer here. <laughs> He's young, but he's not necessarily. Yeah. Let's lean it up against the. Pretty sure it's going to die. Well, that one will probably get me as much as this one will, so because I'll I'll be out there unless I'm switching slides. Yeah. So yeah. in that case, Let's just do that to use it as a stand and so, uh, 
and that's you know what I'm to get stuck. Absolutely two minutes left. Let's find out. Um, let's see. 
So when you're here, there you are. Yep. yep. Yeah. This will be fine unless I do have that tripod. Oh. And that will be my pivot. Even though I have the guy. Adrian? I can't hear you. Probably not. In the chat. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I Oh, no, it's I don't want to see this. Oh, no, it's Well, the discussion groups are just where. Instrumentation. 
After his PhD, he spent a year as a lecturer and postdoc at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, studying active galaxies, and then a year as an assistant professor of physics and astronomy at St. Cloud State University, where he also served as interim planetarium director. Dr. Wilcox is a Michigan native growing up in Cadillac and has returned to the state with his wife and two kids. The, we want to read the, uh, intro? Intro. Okay. Okay. the acceleration of very high energetic particles requires extreme environments. We see these energetic particles hit the Earth as cosmic rays. However, localizing the source of these cosmic rays is effectively impossible as the incoming direction of the charged particles is scrambled by local and galactic magnetic fields. Instead, we rely on high energy gamma rays to help us understand particle acceleration occurring in energetic objects such as supernova remnants, pulsar, wind, and nebula, and active black nuclei. In this talk, Dr. Wilcox will give an overview of the astrophysics behind very high energy astronomy and how we detect such extreme light, focusing on his experience with the Veritas of the Gamma Ray Observatory. Thank you. So, what I've got pictured here, this is the Veritas Observatory. It's in southern Arizona, almost near the Mexican border there. And most of my time, I spent a lot of time there. That's the one a lot of my work was on. Hinges back on the discovery of cosmic rays and understanding that they actually didn't come from Earth. We'll talk about gamma ray observatories. I'll spend most of my time talking about Veritas and the other significant US investment, which is Hawk. This is actually one that's down in central Mexico. And then we'll talk a little bit about the astrophysics behind all of this. We'll go to what actually are these accelerators? What are we actually seeing with all of our gamma ray instruments here? What are we actually seeing and why do we see them? And again, kind of why is it why is it important? Back to the cosmic ray ideas. And then briefly, I'll I'll talk about what the future of gamma ray astronomy is. So seen this image. This is actually the Fermi Ice All Sky image. This shows the sky in energies above one giga electron volt. So this is actually kind of Middle of the road gamma rays that we'll we'll look at and you can very prominently see the the galactic disk here, and this this diffuse emission that comes out of the galactic disk from from the um, that we can see here in gamma rays is all from cosmic rays. We understand this being cosmic rays kind of shooting through some of the dust that's in the Milky Way, and we can see the emission coming from that. I'll go over the mechanism here in a couple minutes. The other thing to point point clear eye to is that we actually see a lot of points. There's a lot of individual points that we also see that are not this big diffuse background. We can pull out these individual gamma ray objects. Now, I'm gonna go over here just as a refresher where we are with gamma rays and gamma ray astronomy. Keep in mind here we're at one giga electron volt, one GeV. And if you've seen something like this before, helping us relate different frequencies of light that we detect, so we have our visible light that's here in the middle. We got kind of our normal scale of bacteria. We have radio waves down there and way far away from me. And over here we have our gamma rays, very short wavelength, very high energy, very high frequency. Now you can see also this temperature of emitting wavelength.
the scale of heat. Now, for scale, as far as what the energies are of these different materials, keep in mind that visible light, we're looking at about We now understand it to be of extraterrestrial origin. As he surmised, he noticed that we have this stream of incoming radiation, cosmic rays, right? Alpha rays, beta rays, gamma rays, now cosmic rays, something not from Earth, that was coming down and was actually hitting Earth's surface. Other Interesting to the distribution of particles. So here we have a plot. We'll see lots of, uh, uh, I shouldn't say lots, we'll see a handful of, of these charts here. So we have basically the number of particles and their energies that are here on the x axis. And we have a couple of different, so it's pretty straight in these terms. Again, this is just kind of a histogram plot. We have energy on the x axis and essentially number on the vertical or flux. But here we have our straight line. That actually bends here, we call this the knee, comes down, bends again at what we call the angle. Kind of looks like a, a bend for it. I'm not really gonna model it here, but we have our, our bent, uh, our, our thigh and our, our shin up here, it bends, we have an angle down there. Some further study, and we can't really isolate perfectly the source of these cosmic rays. As was said in the introduction, cosmic rays get scrambled by magnetic fields. They are charged particles. You put a magnet around there, whether that's galactic magnetic fields, other stellar magnetic fields. It misdirects them. Light gamma rays are not misdirected. They come straight at us. So when we look at gamma rays, we can see more to the source. Cosmic rays, we have, kind of have to play a trick. And we can understand that, hey, things that are coming from outside our galaxy happen to be far more energetic than those that are inside of our galaxy. This is as good as the, the thought process was in the source of cosmic rays. And most of these really are just helium nuclei. They are just protons. Now, this thought about all of these cosmic rays actually coming from galactic sources didn't actually really require all this new data. So these are all 
cosmic ray detectors, all the individual data, we can see the line. This was actually an old idea that after Victor Hess came up and measured the cosmic ray flux, there was a paper by Body and Zvicky where, where they actually noted. Lagging at something. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, what these guys surmised, just from a back of a napkin type of calculation, calculated based on the flux of cosmic rays coming into Earth that Hess had discovered. They looked and said, hey, you know what? There's all this energy that's out there in supernova remnants. Could this actually be the source of the cosmic rays? And when they went through and did, it's a relatively straightforward, it's kind of an odd paper in the end just because of how uh, we approximate this to this, approximate this to this, and we can come to the conclusion here that if we actually count all the, all the cosmic rays we'd expect from supernova in our galaxy, we're within about a factor of two of our cosmic ray flux. And this is held pretty well standard. So I've got a picture of Cassiopeia A here. We'll come back to this a little bit. But a pretty prototypical supernova remnant. We have a shell structure. This is an exploded star from late 1700s that we can see its echo as it's going on. And so they actually took it and understood all these remnants to be accelerating cosmic rays. Now, I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but we have evidence now, very direct evidence, that supernova remnants are the source of gamma ray protons. Now, it wasn't really ever in doubt. Nobody really doubted this idea that supernova remnants were the were the source of these, but there was an ambiguity up until about 10 years ago. When this paper came out, this was a collaboration between Fermi, Veritas, and a handful of other gamma ray observatories. What we found when we actually matched all of the data up, we could eliminate the other sources, or excuse me, we could eliminate other options and really we're just down to supernova remnants are the ones that are creating the gamma rays that we're seeing. And the process that we have here is two helium nuclei, two proton, when they're actually very, very high energy, or one of them has to be very high energy, they get close enough, they produce a pion. This pion is very, very short-lived, and it emits characteristic gamma rays based on the energy of the protons that created it. What we need to eliminate is if we look at some of these curves here, what we had to eliminate in our findings was this dashed line. So these are spectral energy distributions. This is really what we get out of gamma ray astronomy, we get these different energies and how many photons we get from that energy, helping us understand some of these processes. And we can look at these characteristic curves, fit different models to them, and understand hopefully better what is actually happening. So in the end, we were able to eliminate statistically anything that had to do with electrons or much lighter particles causing the, the gamma rays that we are seeing from these particular supernova remnants. So IC443 is the jellyfish nebula. Very nice visible up here. And then W44 is another well-studied supernova remnant. But all of these data points that we were able to get in the very high energy astronomy regime, we're able to pinpoint down to, this has to be from pi out of it. it is not from electrons. There was this idea before that, you know, these still could just be accelerating electrons, we see this in other nebulae. We see this in pulsar wind nebulae. We see this in other things where it's actually the electrons that are accelerated. We understand where electrons get accelerated, but we, before this point, weren't able to prove where protons were being accelerated. And this was a, a somewhat big deal in the, in the community. Now, the second thing that we can do, it's the same thing there, here is actually a, a, a couple of energy distributions from the galactic center. If we look at the very, very interior of the center, this starts to curve down. The other thing that we get out of the data from very high energy, uh, very high energy gamma astronomy, astronomy is actually we can see what energies are coming out of it. So I put this plot up very specifically just to show how this kind of tapers off. And then the one that's actually in the diffuse area stays higher up. We actually start seeing even more energetic cosmic rays. The further and further we look, the more high energy gamma rays we see the more high energy cosmic rays we see. And this is the source of so-called what is now 
being detected more and more, we call these pelotons. Um, these are some of the most of the cosmic ray distribution that I showed you earlier. And we're starting to find more and more of those of those sources near the galactic center near some of these other extreme events, but we have to look at very high energies. Take note here of this scale as well. Here we're looking at one to ten to a hundred TeV. We're looking at very high energy gamma rays in order to understand where this kind of fall off is happening. Am I getting am I getting somewhat pedestrian protons or am I getting extreme protons? And this is some of what these data helps us see. So far in TEV astronomy or very high energy gamma ray astronomy, we've seen a couple hundred objects, uh, about 225, I think it's actually 229 now. There's about 60 sources we still haven't identified. The red dots on this map, this is a projection of the galactic plane. All the red dots are pretty much blazars. All the stuff inside the galactic plane, we have pulsar wind nebula, supernova remnants. Uh, there's a I'll talk briefly about TEV halos, pulsars, very energetic objects. This is objects that we have detected above one tera electron volt. So it's kind of a limited sample. And just to point out a couple, some of these you may have heard of, some of these you didn't. I kind of left the stuff that I've studied intently. Those are the DA495 is the third closest pulsar wind nebula to us. You can't see it visible. You can barely see it in radio. We see it in TEV gamma rays. That was my thrust of research, a couple other uh, X-ray binaries and, and, and uh, other binary systems that we see nearby. Then we have the crab nebulas right here, the veil of pulsar and the nebula are there, Tycho, Cassé, next to each other over there, and of course the galactic sun. These are just to name a few. The marquee TEV object is actually the crab nebula. It is our brightest source in the sky. A telescope like Veritas gets about five gamma ray photons a minute from the crab nebula. And that's our brightest source. Our record for stuff, uh, Markarian 421 is, has flared to about 12 gamma rays a minute on a couple second time scale. We're talking about individual photons that we're detecting per minute. And we'll get into how, how we get. Now, in general, there are a few gamma ray observatories that are currently in operation. So Veritas, the uh, uh, American, and actually uh, they work with DAISY in Germany as well, is in Arizona. Hawk, which I'll talk about here in a minute, is in central Mexico. MAGIC is the Spanish and kind of a general European collaboration. They're in the Canary Islands. And then Hess is another uh, German en enterprise into TEV gamma ray astronomy, and they're in Namibia. Uh, Hess and Veritas are very, very similar in, in function. Anything I tell you about Veritas, Hess was actually designed to be a carbon copy. Magic has a bunch of differences. There's a couple older observatories. There's Malandro, Malandro Observatory, uh, Hegra, which used to be on the Canary Islands, and the Whipple 10 meter uh, gamma ray observatory was actually really the first very high energy observatory, and everything kind of built off of the eventual success of the Whipple 10 meter which was on Mount Hopkins, kind of near the multi-mirror telescope, actually, within walking distance of it. And the era of TEP gamma ray astronomy started in 1989, when we were able to detect the Crab Nebula with the, with the Whipple telescope. And now the source is kind of increasing. We'll talk about Hawk and some of these others, but once the era of these new generation of telescopes went online, you can see we started detecting more and more sources. There's a couple hundred, but very, really quickly, now, actually, I mean, it's not in that quick view, it's been 15 years. We're starting to hit the sensitive, sensitivity limit for most of these telescopes. There really hasn't been a crazy amount of, of discovery just in the last, last few years. So there is some new telescopes that are on the horizon. These are the Cherenkov Telescope Array. We'll talk about these at the end. This is kind of the future of very high energy gamma ray astronomy. There is one planned in the south in the Atacama Plateau and then one in the north that shares a site with MAGIC. So we'll talk about this. There is construction already ongoing on it, and this is a major international collaboration that will see all these but Hawk kind of sunset after, after it's up and running. Now, if you've taken one of my astronomy classes, you've certainly seen this type of image, and we always talk about transparency windows in the atmosphere. 
So we have very long radio, long wavelength radio is blocked, infrared is blocked, gamma rays and x-rays are blocked. So we, we rely on sounding rockets or telescopes to see in these wavelengths. We have our, our nice windows into visible and some infrared. So all this talk about ground-based gamma ray astronomy, we have to understand how we're actually getting these gamma rays. And we're not actually getting gamma rays in this type of diagram is still accurate. The atmosphere is still blocking the gamma rays, but when a gamma ray hits our atmosphere, interacts with one of our very friendly nitrogen or oxygen molecules, it immediately pair produces into an electron and positron. All of the ground-based detectors that we have detect gamma rays indirectly, repeatedly, reliably, and so on. So a gamma ray interacts with a nucleus, something heavy in our atmosphere. There's nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, anything heavy. It'll pair produce all of that energy from that gamma ray. A TeV of energy gets split into an electron, positron. An electron and a positron, those electrons and positrons, the amount of energy that's imparted to them, they are going faster than the local speed of light. The index of refraction of air is 1.00003. These things are going faster than the speed of light given the index of refraction of air. Yeah. Faster than the speed of light. Faster than the speed of light and air. So index of refraction, we have C divided by the index of refraction gives us the local speed of light or speed of light in our medium, right? Yeah. So water would have an index of refraction of point of four thirds, yeah. so speed of light is 0.7. Yeah, these are going in an absolute sense point six nine C. So very, very fast. They emit trunk off radiation in addition to interacting with other things. That electron will hit another nucleus, generates another gamma ray. That gamma ray interacts with another nucleus and so on. We get an air shower. All of these other gamma rays get produced. Each one of these electrons or positrons are actually emitting light when they're in air. This is Trunkov radiation. This is the characteristic blue glow of nuclear reactors. That's the Trunkov curves being thrown around. All of these electrons hit there, they interact. We get Trunkov radiation. This whole shower from the gamma ray to the ground lasts about 10 nanoseconds. A very, very quick thing. Yes? I'll ask the question, answer later. Sure. How can you distinguish on the ground about high energy gamma ray or a high energy proton that started this? We got slides for that. Good question. That, that, that's actually a big bulk of our analysis. I'll, I'll go over that. That's a great question. Now, Veritas, it's a collaboration. Uh, Wayne goes between 50, 100, 150 people now. This is me with one of the four Veritas telescopes. They are 12 meter telescopes in diameter. And we're sensitive to uh, 85 GB to 30 G TeV about. Really, this is more like 200 to 30. This is the formal kind of thing. So this was first telescope was built in 2005, array of all four telescopes. So there's four of them just like this. Finished in 2007, and we've since upgraded the cameras and, and other things. And so, just for a map, here's I-19 south of south of Tucson. Amato's there. Green Valley is just north of there. Have you been to the Missile Museum in Green Valley? It's a lot of fun. So I-19, Nogales is actually just just down there. So the MMT is up on the top of Mount Hopkins. We are actually at the base camp for the MMT. This is the same Smithsonian campus of uh, Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory, FLWO. So the MMT, there's a handful of other robotic and automated telescopes that are that are up there. We are actually at base camp. We need the atmosphere to act as our cover. We need the atmosphere. And it's actually kind of interesting going there to observe uh, as members are expected to go and observe for about three weeks a year. So that was. A, a decent amount of time, but well, depends on my year, including travel and other things. 
And we actually stayed in the dorms up the mountain. So we were usually going up the mountain in the morning and down the mountain at night, which is the opposite of what everybody else was trying to do. So. So Veritas's four telescopes, just to give you kind of a sense of the campus. It does have a visitor center if you're ever down there. It's a fun tour. You can tour Veritas, you can tour the MMT, which is another fabulous piece of engineering. Uh, but there is, it is open to the public during normal government hours. And there are four telescopes that are all identical. Each of these telescopes, they are Davies Cotton Telescope designs. These are old solar furnaces, was their original design. They were meant to actually capture sunlight to get to thousands of degrees at a focused point in an energy efficient way. That was the original goal of these. So they are actually F ratios of one. So the curvature is the same as the, the, the distance there to the, to the focus. They're all on all bad mounts and we can get anywhere in the sky in about, about five minutes with these. We, we can, the, the newer ones are much faster. And everyone has a trailer here that helps feed our about one kilovolt to each of our PMTs, our photo multiplier tubes that make up our, our cam. And that's the camera right here. So this is 499 pixels. This is what we see when we try to collect a shower. We use photo multiplier tubes that are operating at 500 megahertz. That's a sample every two nanoseconds to try and catch these extremely fast showers. Uh, do some mental math about the power required here for operating at a kilovolt, even getting milliamps per sample here at 500 megahertz. It's a lot of power we have to dissipate. All these things back here are just coolers, air conditioners to help us keep our electronics cool and stable. Not because we actually need the low temperature for sensitivity, but because we need the low temperature so the copper doesn't melt. So, and this is about five by five. That's the box up there. And we have, it's a specialized uh, uh, glass plate that we have on there that has cones in it to help us uh, manage some of the stray light. But now back to our air shower and how we use these large telescopes, right? So we have our gamma ray, we have all this light generated. And all of this light that's generated, so all of this Cherenkov light that's generated by our air shower is broadcast in a cone. It's not just like a, a light that's pushed out, like a, a street light. All the Trenkoff light is actually being directed down along the, the, the line of all these particles that are moving and actually makes, an, makes a, a shower and a cone. And we can see this cone in each of our cameras. So if we have four cameras, each looking at the same shower from different perspectives, we actually get stereoscopic view, or in this case, quadroscopic view with four different perspectives of it. We have this glow of light from the extensive air shower. Our very, very fast cameras detect, isolate, and help us clean out some of these images. And then we can reconstruct these if I actually kind of transposed all the cameras. These images are actually already in the ground plane. These are already transposed just for this, the sake of this image. But with some nice geometry, we put these down in the ground plane and we can literally just draw lines and it's probably the simplest line of code in our analysis is how we actually figure out where the gamma ray hit. Now, to your point, now this is what a gamma ray shower would actually look like. It's just a little bit on there. Our field of view, remember, is multiple degrees. These showers end up being a couple tenths of a degree in width. If we actually have a cosmic ray hit, Instead of just having electrons that are there, then reinteracting, getting gamma rays and light and more electrons, when a heavy nuclei hits, in this case I have an iron nuclei there, but if it's proton or anything else, anything else, any, any hadron, it's proton, alpha particle, iron nuclei if they want, when it interacts, it creates all sorts of other particles due to the hadronic interaction. Due to the heavy particle that is being shut, that, that is being interacted here, Conserve all of our mass, we have to conserve all the other hadronic quantities. So we end up having some pions that are spit out, which emit muons, they emit other gamma rays. We get a much messier shower. Muons, actually, their Cherenkov ring is actually very, very small and fits nicely in our camera. We actually use muons for calibration, for instance, because they are very plentiful to us. But that's what we see with, with muons in our camera. 
And then what we do is we find the size and shape. We actually draw a nice circle around it. We call this Hillis parameters. Dr. Uh, Hillis, who designed this technique, we find this size of this the width versus the length compared to all the other images. And if we actually look at this width in a scale version, don't worry about the units on this, we find that protons have a much, much wider width of their, their own wider and messier, and gamma rays have a much, much narrower range that they exist when we look at how, how chunky they get. And now the irony in this, which is not lost on any of us, is that cosmic rays are actually a huge source of noise for us to detect gamma rays. We detect about 100 times more cosmic rays than we do gamma rays. They are constant, and you can see that there is some overlap here. They are still a amount of background that we accept. We look at a, a gamma ray map, we accept that there's some cosmic rays in there. So on, but we try to eliminate as many as possible. That's the goal. So if we look at the showers themselves, these would be cosmic ray showers here on the right. These would be gamma ray showers here on the left. And you can see how nice and tidy and, and slim they are, whereas they get very, very noisy. You can even kind of make out, I should do the muon before, that's probably a partial muon ring in the back of all that mess. And they just end up being very messy, very blobby images in our cameras that, well, we can reconstruct them. We actually do publish results such as iron spectra, helium nuclei spectra, and so on. We can be used as a cosmic ray observatory, but there's, much, there's others that are much better at that. Other data that we get from this, because we are actually figuring out how much light came down, how much did that shower actually expand, we also get other details from there. We get this energy level. We actually can figure out we have a, an electron, or excuse me, we have a gamma ray of 1 TeV. We have a gamma ray of 1.5 TeV. We have a gamma ray of 10 TeV. We can actually measure that simulations and all sorts of other things. Based on what we see on our cameras, normalize that. We get a lot more information out of it than maybe other ones. Yeah. Determining the source of these, we actually put something out. Yep. Yes, yes. So when we're back to back to like this, we're actually getting that that kind of tilt, right? So we we get the ground point and then the orientation of that shower. Yeah. And then extrapolate back out. We know how to point on the celestial sphere. Yeah. 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 No, it's a great question. And any other questions or great questions? Now we get have this ultra fast timing, but our resolution is not the best. Compared to optical wavelengths and so on, our resolution is about a tenth of a degree. So we can isolate gamma rays coming from the sky to about a tenth of, tenth of degrees our PSF, improving slightly over time. And so on this map in particular, take a take a look. This is again IC 443, Jellyfish Nebula. This is one degree declination. And so the the contours here actually bear it's not the color is Fermi. And we see roughly the same thing. This is one of the few objects that we see a good amount of more than just one spot in. We actually can make out a little bit of the morphology of the jellyfish nebula. We'll look at the pictures here next. This is one of the few objects that we do look at the morphology of. Jellyfish nebula, I've rotated it kind of to a line there, but there is some structure there, some features. I think, remember, this is a big degree on the sky. Most objects we actually just see as one pinpoint. Well, a big, big pinpoint. So that's why you don't often see a whole bunch of gamma ray images. Because really, the, there's not that much crazy informative in the images. What we get out is the data about the energies of all the photons that we're getting. Now, how we know where to point? In addition to looking at sources that we already know about, the Crab Nebula being a pulse or wind nebula, looking at supernova remnants and so on, there's an observatory in the middle of Mexico ran by mostly US partners. This is called Hawk. This is the high altitude water Cherenkov Observatory. And rather than having telescopes that are pointed up to look at the Cherenkov light, they run night and day and let the particles come to them. So they actually detect the particles and we can reconstruct the same type of gamma rays that we can 
using the particles that come into their tanks. And they have the same type of idea here where a cosmic ray shower gets spread out, a gamma ray shower is a little bit more narrow and, and put in. These are very large tanks of water. So as we get an air shower particle, one of those electrons or a muon or a pion come in here, we actually capture the light inside the tank. This is important for something like Veritas. We are very inefficient at looking at the entire sky or less efficient. And so Hawk in the TEV regime, remember the very first image we saw was in the GEV regime. If they look at the TEV sky, uh, this is a couple of years ago now, but we can see the galactic plane here. This is actually in right ascension and declination. So we have the galactic plane over there, Gaminga Nebula, which is one of the objects that's only seen in gamma rays, the Crab Nebula, and then the Markarian 421 and the Markarian 501, which are very bright gamma ray blazers. And so we can get additional targets and they've detected a bunch of unknown sources in TV that we followed up on and we've, we've uh, put the screen to and further, further isolated what objects there are. And they look at most of the northern sky from there. Help us identify targets for further, further follow. -up. Now, the objects that they are picking out, a lot of them, particularly in our galaxy, are supernova remnants. So we talk about supernova remnants as being a couple of different objects. I like to still group in the idea of supernova shell type and pulsar wind nebula kind of being in the same related family. A lot of people totally separate them, but in part because we do see them as composites. But of course, we study shell type supernova remnants. We have Cas A there. This is where we're getting all of our cosmic ray protons from. All of these shell type supernova remnants, as they expand out, they are accelerating protons. The protons interact with other gas and they give us gamma rays. Another major gamma ray source, although not a source of cosmic ray protons, are pulsar wind nebula. We'll look at those here in a second, a little bit more. And these are, crab is a prototypical one. And this is all energy coming from a pulsar that is slowing down, it's putting energy into its wind and so on. And this is our uh, they were originally identified not necessarily as these pulsar wind nebulas, but just as what they would call pharonic supernova remnants. All of the emission that we see in all sorts of other wavelengths, if we look at a shell type, really crank this down in the contrast, we really just see a ring. It would be a center of it would be empty versus a center filled object like a pulsar wind nebula or a composite, we'd see everything. Maybe even see a dot in the middle of the ring. And so just the very general morphology. And so the pulsar wind nebula were originally called plurians. Yeah, tiny pulsars. They, they should, um, we see them like in kilonode, uh, then gamma ray bursts. Uh, they're really, really hard for us to see from the ground because they're so brief. But we do, do there's one potential gamma ray burst. And that's something theoretically we should see, but getting on it in time is really accurate. Well, it's the, the, just they only last for a couple of minutes. And so getting the timing is the big thing. Now there is trot, we try to do it. That's, that's a big, big push for sure. Yeah, that's, a, yeah. That, 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 that's another layer to, to some of my puzzles. Yeah. Now, this is one of these things that I came across when I was doing research for my thesis. I, I use the word plurium, and I even forget exactly how I came across this, but just some of the pedantry with some of the naming some of the jargon that is that is all used here. So just the name plurian is actually incorrect. If you want to, if you want to prove somebody one way or the other, it actually really should be uh, plethoric because that's actually the Greek root, root right? We always try to, to to accent the difference between Roman and Greek roots and make sure that it's it's not uh, it's nova and nova and all these type of other things. And then there was actually a, a a brief letter that was written to the editor after they started using the word plurian just to to uh, prove themselves, I guess, they knew the Greek better than anybody else. So I, I often, with my, my advisor, I'll refer to them as plethoric remnants mm -hmm. and they make some chuckles. So a fun, fun moment. But the most popular pulsar wind nebula, the crab, this is just the image in x-rays and probably actually one of the images, I didn't put a video in here just because I didn't know exactly what I'd have. There's a video of this that actually you can see the shock expanding over the course of a couple months. Anybody, everybody seen that or familiar with it? Yeah, 
that's probably why I got into astronomy, is actually that type of video. Being able to see something this extreme actually in motion was pretty crazy. Worked out that I ended up doing gamma rays. And of course, we have a neutron star here in the center. This ring here is about a light years in diameter. And these particles are being accelerated. Not protons, but these are electrons being accelerated. And I always like showing this analogy. This is just kind of like water dripping in your sink. As the water comes down, we have this energy, just like the pulsar that's being injected. All of that water goes out. This water is supersonic. As it gets far enough out, it stops becoming supersonic and get a shot. It slows down, it becomes turbulent. This is where electrons are accelerated in pulsar wind energies. The electrons are all moved out. They come up to these shocks, all these turbulent areas. We get electrons spit out that are at very high energies, extremely high energies. And we look at what exactly their energy distribution looks like. I'll define these emissions here from our electrons in a minute. But we have synchrotron emission. This is what we usually see in the radio here, all the way up into X-ray. We see synchrotron emission from these objects. Then we also see inverse Compton. Now, I bring this up as a counterpoint to the first things that we, we looked at. We're trying to prove that cosmic rays do not come from inverse Compton scatter. These curves, just this little hump here, is from electrons, not from cosmic ray protons. Still very exciting, still very fun. And from all these details and modeling, we can get all sorts of, of information. But this inverse Compton scattering is very specifically from electrons that are interacting with other light. They're making the light up to very high energies. This is one of our main methods of generating TEB gamma rays is from electrons that are actually hitting photons and imparting energy onto them. This is inverse Compton scattering. And all of these different dashed lines are actually different sources of background light. It can be as simple as the cosmic microwave background, or 2.5 or 2.7 Kelvin background light. It could be other light that's generated in the nebula. We call this self-synchrotron or self-Compton self scattering. Or it could be maybe some other infrared light, other nearby stars that's pushing all this light, showering this nebula with light otherwise, and it's upscaling. So we have all of these inverse Compton curves, and this is what has kind of confused the point about where the cosmic rays come from. There are no room, there is no room for protons in this model. Our model here is really just of electron acceleration. We really don't expect protons to be at the core of a neutron star or at the in the fringes of a neutron star to generate this. We could get us lots and lots of protons, lots and lots of electrons and positrons, but no protons. Now, if we look at a shell type spectral energy distribution, pointing out a couple of different things here. So this is our pi on the K. This is what's generated from two protons getting really, really close to each other. When one of them is very energetic, we get pi on. This pion, when it decays, gives us a characteristic kind of one and a half humped kind of spectra. You see it back here. The ones that are a little bit lower, lower counts here. That's actually our reverse shock as well as adding in everything we see. So we have our electron contribution, and this is now our shell type supernova run. And then we have our pion. With the TEV energies, we're able to complete this to notice that we have this pion bump and that these energies are correlating between the protons that we have interacting in these regions and that they're not from electrons. And this was a big deal to demonstrate this, even though again, as I said, it's not really what we do in this. Now, as kind of a potpourri of the other sources, now I did work on active galaxies, specifically radio galaxies, which are nearby active galaxies where we can see the projected jets. And as we've talked about with these extreme environments, we actually can see jets from active galaxies, extreme environments, we get we get TEV gamma rays out of it. We can kind of resolve bits and pieces of these jets and see that there are different regions of them that are higher energy than others. NGC 1275 is a nice cluster of interacting regions. It's got an AGN inside of it as well. We see a lot of gamma rays to it. Uh, 
uh, gamma rays from it. One of the big differences with studying active galaxies versus studying supernova remnants, these guys like to glare on. We actually get a whole lot of variability on there, on the second time scale, on the minute time scale, on the day time scale. And these time scales help us to try and figure out, you know, where is that emission happening in the jet? We don't actually take pictures and can isolate this like the HST image to really say, where is it happening in the jet? But with some of the timing constraints and some of the other data we can get, spectral information, we can help hopefully isolate where is this part, where are these particles being accelerated? Where are electrons being accelerated? Where are protons being accelerated? And for completeness, a couple other sources of gamma rays, gamma ray bursts, as you talked about, uh, one of the kind of running games is actually to detect gamma ray bursts from the ground. So there is a handful of monitoring satellites looking for gamma ray bursts. There's all, always the, the story about early uh, 60s, there was nuclear watchdog satellites that started detecting gamma ray bursts and they almost set off some World War III level events thinking the Russians were launching on us or testing. And no, they were coming from space and they were gamma ray bursts. We've only seen about two from the ground. They were mostly serendipitous. Uh, a new source class that are gamma ray halos. These are very large objects. These are objects that are four or five degrees in the sky that are emitting rather intense gamma rays, more so than even the cosmic ray background. And even more specific than just the pulsar wind nebula, we can actually get pulsar timing in gamma rays from pulsars, just as we can with uh, radio, with gamma rays, because of our very specifically, our, our very fast electronics. Remember, we're getting a lot of these <clears throat> gamma rays to very, very tight time scales, very fine time scales that translates to where we can actually get timing on these pulsars over long periods of time, and which is interesting and seeing how they match up to the X-ray timing and, and radio timing. And I see I've only got a couple minutes left and I'm almost done. So now the next generation telescope is the Trenkov telescope. If four was good, four is better, right? That is a great name. Could you say that one different? So this is a this is a, a, a concept, but there's be one in the Canary Islands and then one in Atacama. And the American contribution is this guy, which is the SCT Short Seal J Telescope. And notice there are a couple of different designs in there, and that is intentional. Each of these different telescopes designs are have different sensitivities. Some of them have wide field of view, some of them narrow, some of them are good for higher energy, some of them lower energy. And put together, we now have a couple of different pockets of gamma rays. We increase our collecting area and so on. And the SCT was inaugurated a couple of years ago. It's actually on the site where Veritas is. It's just kind of back around the corner. This is actually T4's control building. And the crew that worked on it, uh, I designed some electronics that are on it, help us with mirror alignment. We actually have a, a 48 mirrors in the primary, so we have a primary mirror that's right here, pushes light to the secondary mirror, which is made of 24 segments that we can actually flex in real time, and then there is the camera that's about uh, two meters from the secondary mirror, so we have a, this compound system, which gives us a really, really large field of view, and instead of our 499 pixel camera, we have a, uh, a you know, start with 11,000 pixels and grow from there, allowing us to more finely image the showers to help us differentiate between gamma rays and cosmic rays and get finer energy constraints. Now, on the site of the of CTA, this is one of the large scale telescopes. This is the inauguration of, of that. This saw first light in 2018, and it starts to detect the Crab Nebula. I think they detected Markarian uh, 501 now, too. This is a 23 meter telescope, and this is sensitive on the lower end of our very high energy, high energy spectrum. Now, all of these imaging help us to differentiate between electron-dominated cases and proton-dominated cases. Rather than relying on the spectra and the modeling, we can see more precisely inside of what would ordinarily kind of be a blob where we see these gamma rays. Right here is a difference map. So all these red areas here shows that, hey, if we see all this red area here, we know we probably got the that's happening on the outside of the shock. It's not happening in the flurry, and it's not happening on the pulsar wind nebula. We know it's protons. I'll leave you with that.
Question. Thank you. What questions do you have? Do are you running into yes. any observational well, experience? And uh, we're not collecting. We have radiation oncologists in the hospital. Where is their source? How do they accelerate these particles from 10, 10, 10, 12 up to 10, 16? So in the in the pulse I mean, they have the. Is it easy to accelerate? A particle uh, to the speeds that you're talking about? No, that, that's part of the fun. We go back to the an earlier earlier slide here. So one of the very first cosmic ray slides I showed actually shows the particle accelerators that are on here. So the LHC yeah, energy, yeah there. Yeah, so this is the LHC energies. Yeah, can you blunt something in and it it generates somehow? And then you find the like with a rate that is 10 to 16. No, it's not just plug it in. No, the amount of power is very big. It's cryogenics. There's world. something with these accelerators that we don't understand. It's very hard to explain this. Yeah. The Russians claim to have a weapon that is fast, faster than sound, even. Mm -hmm. Is this how they accelerate? Is this the propellant? No, I don't think that's propellant for the hypersonic stuff. Yeah. I'm thinking that this is somehow probably the propellant for the weapon that they're talking. <coughs> Question? No, I, I, there, there's some drive. I, I don't know mean. how to do it either. <coughs> it's the only thing I can think of that is so damn fast. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, all of these, yeah. They sit there and spin them up for a whole bunch. Then they're, they're not compact, right? The LHC is a couple ten kilometers diameter, and they they get them spun up to even get to that energies after after hours. I think I actually don't know the, the time it takes, but I know it's not not a simple just put on that's there. So we have a question online. Let's see, Jim, if I can turn you up. Go ahead and ask him the question. Okay, I put it in the chat room, but are you uh, experiencing any inter observational interference with the uh, with the uh, Starlink satellite constellations or the coming ones, or do you expect any interference? Uh, no, the, so we can we can track that type of stuff actually very nicely and regularly because our cameras get all sorts of of data. Uh, but we we have planes and helicopters that go across all of our. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, he, he was asking if we had uh, if Veritas experienced any interference from Starlink. Yes, that, that is, is certainly plaguing other other optical instruments. Our, our time scales are so short, and we actually can read out. It, it'll just show up as one blip on one pixel to us, kind of like cosmic ray removal in a, I a see. In an optical sense. You're you're very wide field. That's the reason I asked the question. Yeah, it, it, it's it, our our time scales are are so right. short. So we're looking, we're taking pictures every two nanoseconds, basically. So the it just yeah. appears as one pixel and not as a streak. We we have software that we can try and track some of that down, but they they don't appear as more than a pixel to us. Uh, do you expect you know when they get their forty two thousand satellites out there? Uh, do you expect I, any I, I don't, problems? I, I don't think they'll they'll affect us at all because we have, they're, they're all dimmer than most stars. Uh, our we're very blue sensitive as well, and I think they reflect more in kind of neutral. They, they, they kind of reflect reflect more on longer wavelengths as well. Uh, okay. Our cameras kind of don't detect anything longer than about 550. Okay, thank you. Fair. Yep. Thank you, Jim. All right, any other questions? Yeah. We have one out here. Let's go with you first. I think your hand was up first, and then you're next. Okay. Dale, Dr. Dale Parton. As far as the, the higher energy protons, the cyclotron radius of them is on the order 
for light years, if I remember right. So they, they actually do deflect pretty pretty wild. Even even for for TV TV protons. All right, let's get you. Um, so your issues with this really started back in, when you were a grad student at the University of Iowa, is that correct? Correct. And now that you're teaching locally, um, I'm just curious what your long-term goal is. Are you intending to, you know, continue this type of research being funded by wh whoever, or are you more interested in an academic kind of future? I, I'm just sort of curious what you're looking uh, for with this type of a a background. <clears throat> yeah, so, so taking a step back, I actually started out with Astronomy University of Nebraska as one of my bachelor's. So I even backing up, yeah, I, I I kind of messed around, didn't really go to college. I went to college late. So I started out at University of Nebraska, ended up graduating there when I was about 30. And I worked for Kevin Lee at University of Nebraska, who makes the Nebraska Astronomy Applets project. If anybody's familiar with them, they're a set of astronomy labs and simulations and and, and worksheets. And so I actually got really interested more in the education side of things, working for him as an undergraduate. And so that was that really has kind of been my goal as much as this was the, the path to that point. As interesting as all, all this is, I, I'm kind of phasing out of it over time of, of this side of this side of work with working with the uh, the American astronomy. I kind of got accelerated by COVID in part. I could work from home on it and so some of that type of stuff, the, the observatory portion shut down for a period and Stuff, stuff slowed down a bit. But I am I'm going more towards the the education side of things in the long run than than this. All right. Uh, I was reading some notes once from uh, someone who had spent some time in the ISS, and he said a uh, interesting thing that would happen sometimes is when he would be falling asleep, which I guess meaning his eye with eyes closed eyes. Uh, his optic nerve would get a burst of light, in, and he classified it as coming from gamma rays. How, 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 why would he think that it's a gamma ray and not something else? I think it could be generically any cosmic ray. So, so that means that it would uh, penetrate the space station, penetrate his skull, or just his yep. eyelid? Yep. I would say, say all of them. It's going to yeah. pass right through, even back all the way to the Earth. But it's the same kind of effect, right? The flash. But from my understanding, I've heard the similar story, right? It's either interacting with the optic nerve directly or it's hitting the aqueous part of your eye and flashing with yeah. kind of light. And that, that is so I thought the same yeah. thing happened with the Apollo astronauts. They were, yeah, they, they, they maybe, were maybe, seeing maybe that sort of, of light guys. as well. Yeah, it could, could have been one of those guys. Yeah, while they were either in route to the moon or coming back. So at, at a large uh, scale, it would be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> space travel, right? Is all these yeah, right. Yeah, that's the problem with space travel. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? I have you in the. I have two of you. Mirror surface elements. What is that? Mirror surface elements. Yeah, they are. Silver. They are front coded. Just an observation. Hang on, Jim. We'll... Yeah, sure. Yeah, that is. They are they have real mirrors out there because they're exposed. That's uh, something we replace a third of every telescope every year. And... So your focal point amplifier must detect light, right? The gamma reflection from the We're getting the camera ray itself, getting the instrument off the camera. So we're getting a flash of the atmosphere, okay? That is kind of visible light. It's, it kind of means up. Okay. We're just detecting visible light in very, very small amounts, very, very quick amounts. Where's your detector? Here, there's still uh, there's I don't know if you all can hear both question and answer from here. You're next. There are actually tubes that they're on the one front at one point. Yep. Yep. So take a look at the time. Yeah. Uh, 499. And, and their body is kind of killable. So that way we get uh, extreme gain off of single moments. All right, go ahead. 
I got a question about that big tank full of water. Is that the uh, uh, I'm sure it's terrified. I'm not huge on color enough about it. I, I think it's I think it's distilled water. I don't think there's any other treatment to it other than just being distilled water. All right, we're at nine fifty. So I guess what do you want to think, Bob? We have time for any. Yeah, well, Scott. Uh, you ever do one more question? Anybody okay. else have a question? Yeah, you're back here. Levels of blue, right? Yeah. What is it? What is that span of bandwidth? What is the ener different energy is so? Cherenkov radiation that you're measuring. So the Cherenkov radiation from the meat particle is mostly based off of the fraction that's in there. It actually comes in all centered around 400 nanometers ish, peaks of 410 or something. But but it's a it's a fairly narrow band of of of. of it's not not a key number of these energies in the that are kind of in the extreme side of the drop radiation. So it is a fairly narrow, narrow band. We do have to be somewhat sensitive to it, but it's almost all, there's probably more or it edges into the ultraviolet a touch for, for these energies. So I'm going to give the final question to Jim on the chat. Who... <laughs> yeah, well, it's just a, just an observation. You say you, uh, <clears throat> you stayed uh, up at Mount Hopkins at the dormitory up there and then drove down to work every day down to That's Veritas. Right. That's a pretty long haul yep. on a pretty dicey road <laughs> yes it is going up that go, going up that mountain that's uh 25 kilometers 27 kilometers yeah and that that that's a fun drive to do in the morning when you're stone tired after i'm working sure all it is I've, I've been up there before but just for adrian uh adrian once you got the technical thing sorted out i thought the presentation went quite well uh the way you excellent so uh, you know so that's good well we will um We'll do something like this for future hybrid meetings where I'll put this on a tripod or something yeah. like that. The phone seems to work well for volume for you all on the call. And even you all heard some of what was going on here. So we maybe will amplify it or something. We'll we'll figure something out for our next meetings. So so that's good. We our first hybrid meeting and we pulled it off. Thank you. All right. Thank you everybody watching online. Yep. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wilson. Um, we are going to be meeting. Our next meeting is uh, Thursday, May 19th. We're going to be meeting online. Um, I don't know if anybody's going to the Red Coat Tavern after this, but it's typically a uh, tradition. We are having some people go to the Red Coat. Red Coat I'll Tavern, go to the Red Coat. Uh, down on uh, Woodward uh, near 13 Mile Road. We uh, meet and do gastronomy afterwards. Uh, so thank you, everyone, and good night. Good night, everybody. And uh, you're welcome, Tammy M. I see you on the chat. Let's get some of these chat. Oh, yeah. oh, yep. Good night, everybody. We're going to. I'm. The room is going to leave. So uh, we'll we'll get those audio and video things uh, squared out for next time. See you all virtually on the uh, Macomb.